All right, so um, here we have the sliding filament theory. All right, and this what this does is it it describes how muscles actually produce force. Okay, so uh, we'll get into it. We'll talk about it, and then at the end of uh, my explanation, I've, I found a nice little animation that'll hopefully uh, kind of bring together and summarize um, the the topic. All right, so. So once again, talking about human movement, uh, it's accomplished through lever actions, right? So uh, muscles, bones, joints, they provide structure, okay? And the muscles provide, provide the force, okay? The, the, the bones and the tendon connections um, and, and, and the joints, there you have fulcrums and, and, and everything you need to produce motion, okay? All right, so um, motion. Okay, anything that a human does is said to be, uh, can be some sort of a power motion, okay? Uh, traditionally, when we talk about something being a powerful movement, uh, you know, power is very relative. Uh, but we're talking about something that's high force, you know, say like a Olympic lift, a clean and jerk, a sprint, something of that nature. Um, but realistically, everything we do, if there's movement, is a power movement, okay? So if I'm, if I'm jogging doing like an old man jog where my feet don't even lift the ground, I'm just kind of shuffling along, uh, I have both force and velocity, all right? So I have, I have movement, and my muscles are creating force to cause that movement, so I have some sort of a power, uh, all right? So it's everything is power, all right? As, as we go along, uh, I point that out just because uh, it's going to become... Uh, critical that you think of things in terms of uh, power, okay? More so when we get to uh, later units, but for right now, I just want to start planting the idea in your head, all right? So, all right. So, let, let's talk about these filaments, okay? So, it's the sliding filament theory, um, and what you have here are yeah, going from the whole muscle down through these these bundles. Once again, we saw before. Uh, there's uh, down to this unit called a sarcomere. Okay, a sarcomere is an individual unit. Okay, um, and in between the sarcomeres, you see you have light bands, and then we have dark areas. The dark area is is kind of the the inner part of the sarcomere, um, and then the sarcomere is comprised of myosin. Okay, myosin some sometimes called the thick filament. All right, and actin is sometimes called the thin filament. All right, and it's called that because uh, strictly myosin is a much thicker protein. If you look at the uh, atomic structure of it, it's it's much heavier, it's much bigger, um, and then actin smaller, so they call it the thin filament. But anyway, um, that is a sarcomere, okay? This right here is a sarcomere, all right? All right, so here's our sarcomere. We have our, our muscle fiber. This is a myofibril that's coming out, okay? And your, your sarcomere, oh, let me get rid of these... Uh, drawings here. All right. So, your sarcomere is is the the contractile unit of the muscle, okay? It's 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 the functional contractile unit of the muscle. Okay? So what you have are along along this myofibril right here. You have one sarcomere got another one, and another one, and another one, and another one, and another, and so on. Okay, so when these guys, uh, when a muscle contracts, what you're actually getting is shortening of the sarcomere. Okay, so um, the actin, okay, the actin, okay, this part right here, okay, that gets pulled toward the, the, the center of that sarcomere, okay, the myosin, pulls it like this, okay, all right, so, so that's roughly what that looks like, um, 
Let me just erase these things real quick. Okay. All right. So, um, myosin is comprised of this kind of a. Um, it's you know it's it's thick. It's got this uh, center line here called the M line. All right. And that's where it's anchored. But then it's got these these little heads. Okay. These little things we call these cross bridges. And they come off, and their job is to, to interact with the actin. All right. Um, but let's just talk a little bit about our nomenclature. Okay, I mentioned earlier there's light and dark bands in the muscle. Uh, I, I bring this up. It's it's actually honestly not highly critical um, to what I'm going to talk about, but it is something that often comes up, and it's something you should know. Okay, so just the, the portions of a muscle of a myofibril, and why we say um, that skeletal muscle is striated. Okay, all right, it's striated. It has portions that are light and dark. Light and dark. Okay, let's talk about that. So the the dark area, the A band. Okay, the A band is dark simply because it has both actin and myosin. Okay, so if you take if you took a, a light and you shone it and you say you, you shined it uh, behind that that band, there's enough uh, structure, there's enough protein there, there's actin and myosin um, overlapping that it creates a dark appearance. Okay, uh, conversely, when we look over at the light band, okay, uh, right here the I band. It's, it's lighter simply because when you shine a light on it or light through it, there's less, there's less um, material to get in the way. So it, so it just shines through without being as occluded. So you have light and dark. All right. So that's, that's the, the I band and the A band. So those are the different bands of a myofibril. Okay. Beyond that, we have uh, really the things I'm interested in are the, the, the lines. Okay. The M line and the Z line. Okay. So the M line right here is the center of the myosin okay that's where the myosin is anchored you have the z line right here and the z line is the terminal point of the actins okay that's where the actins kind of join together and form a lattice work all right so that's that's kind of the some nomenclature for you for uh, for muscles and we'll move on to um, another I'll look at some of the orientation here. All right, so um, thus far we've kind of seen the sarcomere and the way that uh, the muscle fiber and fibril uh, are put together in more of a, a 2D. Okay, now it's it's important to recognize that um, these things are happening in three dimensions. Okay, so if we were to look at this, all right, a single sarcomere might be something like uh, let's say this okay we have uh, dark and light okay so so these light ones here these light or circles these would be actins okay and then the dark one we'll just change color here the dark one here this may be a myosin all right so this one myosin is going to interact with all of these actins Okay, and then this myosin is going to interact with this one, and this one, and this one, and, and you see where I'm going with this. Okay, so there's um, there's lots of, of, of you know interplay here. Okay, this is more of a matrix than it is just one myosin interacting with two myosin uh, with two actins. Okay, so think about this in, in three dimensions as we go along. Okay, this lattice work is is very much a three-dimensional thing. All right, so let's move on. All right, so when we talk about the sliding filament theory, now we've talked about some of the, the, the material involved. Now let's talk about the process, all right? So uh, we've already seen before from uh, an earlier lecture that sar the sarcoplasmic reticulum um, stores calcium, okay? So that, that's, what, that's what it does. And... Um, when it, when the depolarization occurs, okay, when you get a depolarization, 
the sarcoplasmic reticulum is signaled to release calcium. Okay, so the calcium, okay, calcium is going to come out, okay, into the sarcoplasm. All right, so it's going to just basically, you know, sarcoplasmic reticulum is an organelle within the muscle fiber that runs the length of it. Uh, once it gets a depolarization, once it gets a signal uh, from your nervous system, it's going to release calcium. Okay, that's step one. Calcium hits the sarcoplasm. All right, so step two, that calcium. Calcium um, is said to be the on-off switch for the whole process. Okay, so calcium will bind with uh, this thing called troponin C. Okay, so... Uh, let's talk about the actin a little bit and we can start to get an idea of what that is. All right, so starting uh, at the actin. Actin here, it's a, it's a helical kind of molecule, all right? So we have kind of a, a twisting motion, right? Okay, so along along that, uh, that, that twisty kind of molecule, you have these little binding sites. You see these little guys? Okay, so... That's where the myosin cross bridges uh, are going to be attaching, okay? But they're not always open, okay? This is kind of a, a barren uh, model here. On top of these, top of these binding sites, we have a structure called a tropomyosin, okay? So the tropomyosin sits on top of the binding sites like this, right? And it, it closes them. It keeps them from being able to bind. All right. And the thing, if you will, the, the, the regulator of whether or not the tropomyosin sits on top of the binding site is, is a structure called troponin. All right. And troponin C is a, um, is a subunit of troponin. Okay. And it's called troponin C because it, it interacts with calcium. Okay. It's very simple. So, what happens is calcium goes out into the sarcoplasm, um, and then it, it's attracted to this, this troponin C complex. Troponin C will grab up that, that calcium and bind with it. Okay, so now we have here a troponin C and a calcium. All right, when that happens, when when troponin C binds with uh, with calcium, it causes a shape change in this troponin complex. Okay. That shape change causes the tropomyosin to shift off. Okay, so the whole thing shifts off to the side. It kind of gets pulled out of the way, and now these binding sites are open. They're open for business. All right. So now the binding sites are open. Well, now we can have the next step: myosin binding. All right. So. These cross bridges, those little offshoots we saw earlier from myosin, um, they they always want to be binding with those binding sites. It's kind of their only job. Okay, so they just sit there and they wait for the tropomyosin to move. When the tropomyosin moves, they immediately try to grab on. Okay, form attachment. And and when they do, there's some some chemical stuff that happens. Okay, um, this is the start of what we call the cross bridge cycle. All right, so. First thing, um, on on the cross bridge, okay, you will have a bound ATP, okay. It's just sitting there. Um, it's later on we'll see. It's it's important, but but there's an ATP that's bound onto that cross bridge, okay. Um, when this cross bridge interacts with and binds with that that uh, uh, active site on the on the actin molecule. Um, it hydrolyzes, okay? So uh, hydrolysis of ATP is this little equation right here. ATP gets broken down into ADP and a phosphate, all right? So there we go. We have an ATP. It's going to turn into an ADP plus phosphate, or inorganic phosphate. That's the PI, okay? Now, uh, when it gets broken down, these parts here, Okay, they don't go anywhere. They stay on the, the cross bridge. Okay, so so it's not as though um, you know they're they're leaving. They're just they're bound 
on here. Okay, So they're sitting there. They just get broken apart. And by them breaking apart, the energy we get out of that reaction helps the binding process. Okay, So, so now it's bound. All right, and, and it's what we call, it's in a strong binding state now. All right, so here we go. With the myosin has bound onto the actin. It's got that ADP, it's got that phosphate. Um, it's, it's all still on there, all right? So moving on, now we look at the power stroke. Okay, the power stroke is where we're actually gonna get motion. Okay, uh, thus far we've talked about a lot of structures and, and, and how the things kind of interact and some, some terms, but we haven't gotten yet to the point where motion occurs. Now we have, okay, the power stroke. The power stroke occurs when um, the cross bridge moves from a 90 degree orientation to a 45, all right? And that occurs when the phosphate that was bound onto the cross bridge is released. Okay. When the phosphate releases, it causes a shape change in the cross bridge, which which then makes it change orientation. And and it's it's a very very minuscule amount of, of of force that it's producing. But when you multiply that by a few million times occurring simultaneously within that fiber, oh well then you start to have some sort of an appreciable force. Okay. And what it's causing is a sliding of the actin and myosin. Uh, filaments. Okay, so as as the actin grabs onto the head, uh, the the uh, the when the actin grabs onto the myosin, grabs it and shape changes, it's it's yanking on that actin and it's shortening, uh, it's moving that actin toward the M line of the myofibril. All right. So uh, once once the cross bridge has moved its orientation, once the power stroke has occurred. Um, well, the cross bridge is basically done. Okay, it doesn't doesn't have anything else it can do at that point. So uh, the only thing left for it is to detach from the actin, um, and then try to grab on and create another power stroke. Okay, think about like rowing a boat. Um, you know, once you pick your oar up, sink it into the water, pull, and the oars are in front of you now. Well. You're done, okay, right? You're, you're done with your with your row. You have to now pick the oars up, put them back in the water, and do another pull. It's it's the same thing, all right? So they're just going to release from the actin, grab onto another active site, and then the the process is going to kind of keep continuing. Now, in order for that to happen, uh, that ADP molecule has to release from the cross bridge. Remember, the first part of the cross bridge attaching to the actin uh, is the hydrolysis of an ATP into ADP and phosphate. All right. Well, if if the ADP molecule doesn't leave the cross bridge, well then that that cross bridge can't grab onto a new uh, active site, another another binding site, right? So so after uh, you have a power stroke, the ADP will release. And an ATP molecule, which is just kind of floating out there in the sarcoplasm, uh, will will bind. Okay. Once it binds with the cross bridge, it causes the binding of that ATP to the cross bridge actually causes the um, release of that cross bridge from the actin. Okay. So essentially, from that point, we're just going to we're going to rinse and repeat. We're going to do it over and over again. That, that cross bridge will keep attempting to grab on to the actin, have a power stroke, release, grab on, power stroke, release, grab on, power stroke, you get the point. It will keep doing that until one of two things happens. One, calcium ions are removed from the sarcoplasm. Okay, so if, the, if calcium ions um, are removed, then the tropomyosin will slide back over the active site or the, the binding sites and well then it, it can't grab on okay or the other thing is uh, if ATP levels become depleted to such a point that there's not enough ATP for the cross bridge to um, take up a new one when the ADP releases okay in that case um, the muscle is going to stay uh, attached it's, it's not going to be able to move you're going to have a state of rigor all right so Essentially, calcium is said to be the controller of this whole process because um, 
when calcium is released by the sarcoplasm, the muscles will start to contract, they'll start cycling, the filaments will start moving. Um, and then when calcium is removed, the contraction stops. It, it has to uh, relax. All right. So uh, I'm now going to turn on a, a little animate. A myofibril contains contractile units called sarcomeres. Sarcomeres run adjacent to one another down the length of the myofibril. Each sarcomere consists of alternating thick and thin protein filaments, giving skeletal muscle its striated appearance. The muscle contracts when these filaments slide past each other. The thick filaments are myosin, which are anchored at the center of the sarcomere, called the M-line. The thin filaments are composed of the protein actin, which are anchored to the Z-lines on the outer edges of the sarcomere. Because the actin filaments are anchored to the Z-lines, the sarcomere shortens from both sides when actin filaments slide along the myosin filaments. Although the action between the filaments is described as sliding, the myosin filament actually pulls the actin along its length. The cross bridges of the myosin filaments attach to the actin filaments and exert force on them to move. This action is known as the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. In this model, the sarcomeres shorten without the thick or thin filaments changing in length. A contraction begins when a bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. This causes the myosin head to extend and can attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. An action called the power stroke is triggered, allowing myosin to pull the actin filament toward the M-line, thereby shortening the sarcomere. ADP and inorganic phosphate are released during the power stroke. The myosin remains attached to actin until a new molecule of ATP binds, freeing the myosin to either go through another cycle of binding and more contraction, or remain unattached to allow the muscle to relax. Muscle contractions are controlled by the actions of calcium. The thin actin filaments are associated with regulatory proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. When a muscle is relaxed, tropomyosin blocks the cross-bridge binding sites on actin. When calcium ion levels are high enough and ATP is present, calcium ions bind to the troponin, which displaces tropomyosin, exposing the myosin binding sites on actin. This allows myosin to attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge.